Hi everybody, I'm Vicky. Hi Vicky. And this is Women Who Write. And we are so late. I am so sorry. You know, I'd like to apologize to you out there in Facebook land. And if you're anywhere outside of the Los Angeles metropolitan area, I'm sorry. If you're in the Los Angeles metropolitan area, I just want to say, why aren't you here in the living room? At least two dozen people today wrote me and decided they were going to stay in their pajamas and watch it at home. But if you're watching it at home, you don't get to do this. Come here, Jules. Come here a second. This is what happens when you're in the living room. First of all, you get Penny's um, kugel, but then, you also, but then you also get to do this. And let me tell you, everybody's going to get one of those. Okay. All right. This is it. So, so that's what you're missing at home. So, uh, so next time, get your ass in the living room. All right. So I'm blushing now. Okay. So, so I just want to say that I've been on after the last women who write. I had about 20 pieces of kugel. No, I didn't. I, but I, but I, did, I did. Thank you. I did have two pieces of kugel. I had fried chicken. I had all the shit. And then I went to Jenny Craig. No, but I actually went to Jenny Craig, weighed in, and then ate all that shit that night because it was my last <laughs> night of food forever. So I gained two pounds before I even started that they didn't even know about. But I still lost five pounds the first. So they say you're going to lose 15 pounds the first month. They lie. You lose 15 pounds the first month if you weigh 700 pounds when you start. Because if you're just a normal, per, you know, a regular person, you don't, you can't lose that fast. But anyway, so I'm on this whole fast track thing. You don't eat for 12 hours. My son opens the microwave and sees my dinner, which is this big, and starts laughing at me. I mean, it, I'm starving to death. But I have lost, as of today, a month later, nine and a half pounds. Woo! I just want to say, not one of you fucking bitches noticed. So, so what is the point? Vicky, you look so thin. <laughs> but uh, but I, I'm, I'm distracting with my cleavage, which I tend to do. And this, by the way, my voice is weird because I still have no, I have notes on my, pre-notes on my vocal cords because I had to take medicine for an infection, which then caused reflux. Aging is... Just, anyway, so this is wearable art that Katrina Kakendis made. Wait, but let's do one without me with my mouth open. Um, it's fantastic. And she custom made it, and I knew that Jules would be here today, so I asked her to give me a pop of red. I wore red lipstick for the first time since I was 22. I look like a clown, and Jules is not wearing any red today. So I just want to say... You know, there you go. But so you get me with this red mouth. And you look awesome. It's, it's, yeah. it's, it's, yeah. I, I feel like a clown. No, no. Yeah. You're, you're funny, but what? you're funny, but you don't look like a clown. Oh, I love you. Okay, so we're gonna get to this. We're gonna now. So now we're gonna get to. We're gonna get to. The, we're gonna get to the meat. So as you guys know, if you know me, and those of you who don't, I tend to lean young. So, uh, I lean young because I like it, but also because, not really, seriously, about 30 years ago, when I was young-ish, um, no, I was, kind of, yeah, um, three psychics told me that I, I've been married twice, but for long, but for long period, not, these were not like little 10 years, 20 years, I mean, you know, substantial, formidable, and, um, she told me there was going to be a third mate in my life. Not necessarily a marriage, but a partner for the rest of my life. We were going to live out the rest of, our, of my life together because she said, I think that he is going to be scandalously younger. Uh -huh. Scandal. Now, what does scandalously younger mean? Well, 30 years ago, scandalously younger was my then boyfriend who was eight years younger. That was kind of scandalous back in the day. And when you're 30 and your boyfriend's 22, Actually, it wasn't quite like that, but I was, but, but yeah, that was kind of, but like, what is scandalous today? What, what do you think? What do you Helping think? Helping someone with their SATs and then having sex with their SATs. <laughs> Helping somebody with their SATs and then having sex with them. I like it. What, what? Having to drive them somewhere because they're too young to drive. Or my boyfriend's so young, my negligees have feet. Yeah. But, um, but so really, seriously, what do you think is a scandalously, now for men it's very different. Um, I saw Alec Baldwin last week. Alec Baldwin has four children under the age of five. He is 60. 
It's a whole different ball game when you're a man. It's been that way through history. But for a woman to a man, what, really, somebody throw out a number. 25. What you, 20 years. 25 year, 20 years is scandalous? 20 30. 25 years, 30 years, okay. Do I have, do I have? Okay, so here we go. So, Eileen Young, scandalously younger, you better watch out, except. That's fine. <laughs> He's French, everything, well, I don't know if I am. Okay, so, so I've tended on my Tinder to set my bar, I don't want to say very low, very low age-wise. So my, my thing is set at 35, and for a long time it cut off at 45, because then it's not scandalous anymore. So, and I was, I was living it, right? So it turns out, so I had two romances in the last year or so, and um, both of them were with scandalously younger men. And my very first question to them is always, do you want to have children? I mean, as soon as we get past the, I think you're hot, I think you're hot, let's go. So, in both cases, I was told, no. Until three weeks later, when they changed their mind, because their sister told them that they should, or their mother told them that they should, and then all of a sudden, there we are. Where the hell are we, right? Okay, so then I meet a guy recently, and I, and, and I tried. I tried only going 50 to 60. I did it for like a month on Tinder and Bumble. All I did was swipe guys 50 and 60. And there's more than one person in this room that qualify for that, that in a red hot minute, but anyway, that's beside the point. <laughs> um, but it didn't work out for me. It just wasn't, it, it wasn't my thing. Because I've, I've had the mindset now. I, I gotta swing young, I, not swing. I don't, I don't swing. Um, anyway, so I meet this guy and he's 36. And um, we, he pursues me and we go out. And from the first moment we made eye contact, it was like, wah, and um, wah, it was like that. And um, wow, and that was shocking. And so in that first lunch, one of the conversations we had was, do you wanna have children? And so the answer was, I don't know. I do not wanna have them now, I know for sure. I don't know if I ever wanna have them, but I do know that I wanna have a partner. That's really the right, perfect partner. That's what's important to me. Okay, so things go on. And so the weeks go by and the dates go by and then there's a call from his mom. <laughs> <laughs> and so I get it, I get it, I get it. But it sparks thinking. And it, the thinking that it sparks is, I still don't know if I wanna have children, but if I do, and I stay with you, that option, is the door is closed. It can't happen. I already have my children. It cannot happen. Therefore, there is no longer choice. Now, I appreciate that. I respect that. So I said, I guess we have to do the mature thing and we have to stop seeing each other. And just as I was typing that, because we do everything by text, because that's what you kids do. <laughs> He's not a kid. He's quite the man. But um, so, <laughs> Wouldn't he enjoy grandchildren? <laughs> well, I'm getting to that. So, at the same time that I'm typing, I guess we should do the mature thing and stop seeing each other, he's typing, well, I guess normal people would stop seeing each other. And we had had plans for that weekend. And I got really sad. And the thought, and so then we kind of agreed that we would sleep on it. Oh, oh no, I said, well, do you think we could have like a last plan? <laughs> just one last, can't we just have those plans on Friday and just kind of do that anyway? So we decided to sleep on it. Together. No, I, it would have been so much better if we would have slept on it together. So I go off and I call my friend Zoe, my very good friend Zoe Moon, who is engaged to a guy who is far younger than her. Scandalous may be bordering on scandalous, but not quite, not nearly as much as mine. Okay, because mine, 26 year age difference, I'm 62. Okay, so that's, that's, that's what you call scandalous. So I call Zoe and she says that she had the same thought when she started seeing her guy. And so she said, look at it, check this out. The average life expectancy for an American woman is 73 to 78. 
I said, wait a minute. <laughs> Are you killing me in 13 years? Is that what you're saying, is that I'm going to die in 13 years? She said, think about it. Even if you live 20 years, even if you live 25 years, he can still have another family and have kids. I'm going to die. No, wait. And I'm thinking about it. If I get to 88, that's pretty good. I'm, I'm kind of okay with that. In 25 years, this guy's only in his early 60s. I'm thinking, wait a minute. My father-in-law had two kids in his mid to late 60s, lived to 96 to see them all grown up and have their own kid. One of them have her own kid. Got to see his grandchild be eight before he... I said, wait a minute, this is kind of starting to make a little bit of sense to me. And Alzheimer's runs in my family. So in like eight years, I'll probably forget his name and then he can start looking. So the point is that, that this could blow up tomorrow. This could blow up, we know, right? One minute at a time, one day at a time. There's no guarantees on anything. This is a brand new thing. This might not, this might go nowhere, but there's no longer a closed door. Now there's a field of possibilities. And I looked up the percentage of scandalously older women to younger men, which they categorize as 24 years. I just made a cut. 0.03%. Um, so the 0.03% solution is just die, <laughs> get Alzheimer's, and let the guy go do his thing. And, um, you know, I gotta say, so, um, so we had that last fling, which hasn't yet been the last fling. And so, you know, so, but meanwhile, the, the challenges of being an older woman with a younger guy is very interesting because, you know, like I now have acid reflux. So, you know, if I talk about acid, it's like, oh, you know, I'll try that. You know, but we're talking about something. Then I had to get like, I had to get like this, um, this foam, um, uh, what is it called? Wedge for my bed to like, so because of my aches and my pains and my thing. So it's kind of like a sliding pond, you know, so we just make things fun. Um, but, but we just, we just make things fun. Anyway, so, you know, I, 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 I don't know that this is something that makes any sense. And like, I guess the thing is, we have nothing in common. What do we have in common? We have nothing in common. What can we have in common? I mean, some, some young men, you know, watch the classics and are very schooled in pop culture. He's very unimpressed with celebrity, sorry. Um, uh, he, he, that's not his world. He has his own passions. But what's really nice is he has this great big life of his own. And I have a great big life of my own. And we sort of bang into each other once in a while. So, uh, so, so you know, I, I, I don't know, I don't know where it's going, what it's doing, but I just want to say to those psychics that told me this, really, did you have to tell me this? Because if I didn't know this, you know, so, so I've read, you know, I'm, I, I don't know, I don't know. Anyway, th th this is, this is my thing and my point oh three. So what do you think? Is it, is it crazy? Yeah, it sounds like you're, you're having a good time. Just go so with it. Safe. Right? So, so yeah. Just so go with it. Go with, go Just with go the with flow. It. You're a young at heart anyway. So. And I, I mean, really, come on. Yeah. 62. Mm. Is wow. his mother watching this? <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, God, I hope not. Um, my, and my, so my mother will watch it. And I actually, to, I actually called my mother when Zoe told me her idea. And we were, we were laughing so hard, we were crying. My mother's not amused. My mother keeps t advising me to go to J-Date. <laughs> go on J-Date. I see you with a businessman. She doesn't care how old he is as long as he has money. That's the only, you know, Jewish mother, that's all. That's all that's important. Um, but anyway, so it's, it's, it's interesting. It's challenging. It's, but but it's, a, it's a new world now. And I, I really do think that age is irrelevant mm -hmm. because we have so little in common. Our lives are so different. But when you're human, eyeball to eyeball, person to person, who cares? I got all of you to talk to about celebrity and books and movies and I mean he does all of that stuff he actually he actually has a master's he's more educated than I am he actually is <laughs> yes, very educated and, and very intelligent yes is you may his, ask a question is, is his mother in Los Angeles uh, I, you know I'm not I'm not exactly sure I, I I don't know where his mother is and, and, and I, I 
I, his mo he's not. It, it's not about his mother. It's about himself. It's about his, you know, that was just kind of being snarky. It, it's about what, what's, what's good for him and just for him to know that there are open doors and there are choices and that you're not walking into something and then walking into a wall. Who wants to do that? I would Did his like mother, that. was that a joke or did his mother actually well, talk to him? Well, I'm trying to stay on my side of the street and not take his inventory, which I kind of promised to do, so I'm, I'm not going to directly answer that, but... <laughs> but that sparked the thinking. But the but the but the truth is there, you know, that it that it is an issue that that is a fair one. But I do think that the point oh three solution kind of solves everything because he doesn't want to have kids now anyway. And the thing is, like I said, don't know. This thing could blow up tomorrow. It could blow up when I get off of this. He could watch this and go, Wow, no, uh uh. <laughs> go away. <laughs> Um, and, uh, you know, so I don't know what it's going to be. I, I do know that now I've, you know, I've got the formula, though. You know, this, can, this shit can work. Yeah. All of a sudden, it's not so ridiculous. Yeah, I just have to, you know, 88. If, so that, that's the other thing. I should, like, write, I should, like, make a contract that if I, I'm not gone by 88, you can just pull the plug. And if there, if there is no plug, I don't know. Suffocate me with the pillow, with my wedge. With my, <laughs> suffocate me with my, me with my reflux wedge. <laughs> anyway, so anyway. Um, a new yeah. definition of wedgie. A new definition of wedgie. It is a new definition of wedgie. So, okay, so so tomorrow night um, on the road taken, um, my, my very good friend and mentor, Anson Williams, is going to be in the house. He'll be right here talking with me. And I have to tell you, um, if you, if you, didn't uh, we did a podcast together? But this is going to be a video, and Anson and it'll be live tomorrow on the Facebook at 7 p.m. Pacific time. Anson, okay, we know him as Potsy from Happy Days. Everybody knows that. But what I didn't know when I first met him is that he is an extraordinary director. He's got a huge body of work. He's a, he's won writing awards, directing awards. He's also an entrepreneur, and he has a product right now um, called Alert Drops, and I'm going to talk about it more tomorrow. But I have had them in my car for months, and the other night I was coming home very, very late from Santa Monica, and I was really tired, and I gave my, and it's pure, there's no drugs, there's no, there's no caffeine, there's no nothing, it's made from organic lemons or something, but I, I did a hit of Alert Drops, and I was <laughs> wide awake, and like 15 minutes later, I did another one, because I was falling asleep again, and boom! This stuff works, and so Anson, like his uncle, was like Heimlich of the Heimlich mm -hmm. maneuver. Yeah. So there's a anyway. He's in entrepreneurial and really brilliant and really really fun. So uh, that'll be tomorrow night. And also coming up um, on the road taken is Jack McGee, who just finished on Broadway with Denzel Washington, and so he, he coming and he did his made his Broadway debut in Middle Life, and uh, that's pretty exciting. So we'll talk to. To Jack, there's, I'm going to New York with Samantha, with my daughter, in a couple weeks to find her an apartment. And, um, oh my God. And the realtor's already telling me that I have to go about 50% above my budget. Um, oh, oh. Um, but anyway, I'm going to be doing some live shows from, from New York. And so, very exciting people coming up that I'm really looking Pizza. forward to. And Pete, I know, but I'm on Jenny Craig. What the hell am I going to do? I'm going I'm to I'm gonna have to, I know, I'm going to have to go to Joe's and cut it in, in a quarter. And then just eat the rest of and screw it. Um, so, okay, so anyway, um, I, I, I want to do some, uh, oh, and also I'm going to be doing some rebranding on, on the Road Taken, changing the name, and Zoe told me I'm not allowed to tell you what it is until September 5th because of the stars. Because Mars is red, I don't know, Mars is up my Uranus, I don't know what the hell is going on. But anyway, yeah, rebranding the show, and um, I could use all of the good energy to, um, to take it to the next level and get this sucker moving, because... Um, and with you guys, I'm, we're going to take August off because people have summer plans and you know all that kind of stuff. So we're going to take August off, and we'll be back in September, and I'll I'll let you know who's coming. But it's going to be a very exciting first show back. So I'm looking forward to that with you guys. And I want to uh, ask you to please help me thank Linda Apsey, who takes the most incredible. <laughs> I mean, like, I, I've, been, I've been bringing back photographs. My Throwback Thursdays are always Linda's photographs. Mm -hmm. I mean, my entire life. And thank God she takes 10 years off with every picture. I gotta love that. Um, can you take the pounds off too? Um, she's, uh, her photographs are, are just extraordinary. And I also want to thank my girl, Amy Geisel, behind Yay! the camera. I love you, Emma. Thank you. And please help me.
me thank Elach, who, uh, who welcomes you with... Uh, uh, you guys, you, you literally... I'm going to start introducing you. So you have like... Uh, um, sorry, but you stayed for my thing. I didn't think you were going to stay. So now I'm going to like introduce you. So you're totally screwed. Um, I no, you don't have fun. You got to get your stuff and come back down. You, you can miss your introduction to you, but you can't. You got to be here. We're live. Um, that was Jules and Coy. They're going upstairs to like warm up. No, there's no warming up now. Um, so, oh, and 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 and. Um, every week when you guys, every month when you guys leave, this house looks like a train has uh, literally. Uh, there, there's food under the on everything. There's stuff everywhere. There's and Penny Barnett stays for hours after you guys leave, and she does the dishes, she throws everything away, she mops my floors. She is an angel! I love you. Thank you so much. And so that's so I can sit and do all the social media. I, I need an intern. I really need it. I need an assistant so badly. I really do. And I'm actually going to be looking for a camera person too, so if anybody knows anybody, I'm going to be doing that. Okay, so... You all got a gander at Mr. Jules Galley. It's a nice little gander, isn't it? A nice, tall French drink of water. <laughs> yeah. He is an award-winning French singer-songwriter. And at 24, he has managed to amass a rabid following of monster industry talent. I went to, thanks to Dennis and Karen Avalon, thank you, Dennis. They dragged me out to a show that I did not want to go to in the middle of the week. It was really late. It was at Lucky Strike, right? right? And how loud was it, Dennis? It was very loud, but it was amazing. It was That's amazing, was. but but it was I just his stage crap. We we were we were standing right in front, and I was right in front of the speaker, and I was crying. I literally and I forgot earplugs, and it was so loud that particular night. Right. But when I came back, and but watching his performance, and what was even more fun was watching other people watch his performance. Because the men were going just as insane as the women. He, he has, I mean, like Rob Morrow is a huge fan. Gary Stockton, I mean, I know Steve Postel. People in the business that, I, that are really respected musicians are rabid fans of his. And let's talk about Koi for a minute. Okay, this is crazy. I'm going to read this to you because I found this this morning. and it blew, I knew a little bit of this, but I did not know it all. Coy simultaneously received the highest score of any high school student in the entire state of New York. New York represent! Yeah. Um, the year in, in, in uh, the New York All-State Piano and the New York All-State Symphony Orchestra auditions. At 16, she was accepted to Yale University, where she formed her first rock band as lead singer, was assistant concert mistress of the Yale Bach Society Chamber Orchestra, and toured coast to coast as musical director of her Yale a cappella group, while still managing to complete her pre-medical studies, get accepted to medical school at the University of Buffalo, and graduate with a BA in English all by the age of 20. While earning her MD, hello, a doctor, Coy continued to front and play in a rock band and sang the national anthem at her graduation in front of an audience of 1,000 people. After which she decided to eschew medicine and moved to Hollywood at 24 to continue <laughs> pursuing her lifelong passion for music. And I'm sure her parents were so proud. <laughs> She's performed with Macy Gray, Adam Lampert, and most recently Grammy-nominated Gallant on the CBS Late Late Show with James Corden and has toured the U.S. and Europe several times over. But as far as I know, she plays a whole hell of a lot with our own Jules Galley. <laughs> Jules creates a frenzy whenever he hits the stage. Now, we're going to see an acoustic version of their set, which I haven't witnessed firsthand, but I'm really excited about. But I will tell you, and I don't know if we can get up and get him to move, but oh my god. I am telling you, get to a show when he's got his full band. Um, Jules... Um, Jules Galley and the Family Jewels, is, no, family jewels, and the fa Family Jewels, um, which is so clever, isn't it? He's clever, too. Um, go see him live. It's when they are live with the full band, it is, and he's just at the microphone and can do his thing. It's really something to behold. His latest EP, Without Your Love, just dropped, and we're going to get lots of tastes of it, which is wonderful, because he's going to do an extended set. They're going to do an extended set. He's open for Macy Gray as well, and what's next for him? I, 
I say it now with total confidence, the man's a star. <laughs> and so is Koi. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Jules Galley and Koi Aninka. <laughs> I appreciate uh, the fact that you don't discriminate. <laughs> and obviously, she's the smart one. Wow. She does lots of writing as well. <laughs> so we're going to play a, a first song, which is called The Beginning. And, uh, and it's how to, keep, how to keep that, she talked about it, you know, the love that you, uh, that you want, the love that you at least think you need. And instead of saying, fuck it, we're done, how can we get back to the beginning, to where everything was, was all right, you know? We didn't have to talk about why it's not all right. And so here is <coughs> the beginning. Do you want to see as far as volume yet? today. Yeah. All right. Tell me how 
forever Honey, I don't know Honey, I don't know We keep on hiding Still I keep on trying Oh, how do we start from the beginning? I want to know now Will you tell me, baby How do we keep this love from ending? alive when I'm playing them so I have to play them um, you know artists in this room you understand when you create something new it's what makes you you know wake up in the morning and you just keep going and I just don't want to dwell on the songs that I wrote when I was like 19 years old you know what I'm saying so I respect that a lot. so here we are but please listen to the EP uh, on Spotify, on Apple Music, on SoundCloud, all that stuff. I hope you enjoy it and uh, we're working hard to bring you even better music very soon. So you're getting a taste of all the new stuff. I hope you find it very tasty. <laughs> Yeah, it's a 
<laughs> like dreams, what are those? <laughs> Go back to the grind like everybody else. <laughs> so this was a song about, uh, you know, trying to believe in yourself in the hardest uh, moments, which we can all feel sometimes. And um, this next song is about getting naked. <laughs> Here we go. Nice. Oh, I know. sorry. This one's for you. Fingertips, I feel your touch It's all about what you look like And silver in your moonlight You got me in the moonlight I feel it for the first time And one thing I know, time we borrow Right now, what we got It's your body on my body I keep dreaming about Take your clothes off
it's too cold in your apartment. It's like my clothes off. The AC is like, woo! Real AC and I, really? Oh, okay. Yeah. Like it's, it's okay. It's I don't, I just, hot. I don't, yeah. See, this is, it's she hot. loves it. I don't like it. I don't like AC. Mm -hmm. That's just out there. I fucking hate AC. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> this next song is called Cookies and Gin. That's a hell of a combination. It is. That's what happens when you're 24. Oh, yeah, you can mix a bunch of shit together. <laughs> But who, who said that cookies and gin were actually cookies and gin? Oh. See? Well, we get what it is. Yeah, I think, you can make, I think you can make up your mind as you listen to the song, you know? Okay. <laughs> Taste it already. I need you to feed me, relieve my hunger. Mm. Need you to need me and call me lover. Craving the same thing we cave in amid our appetite. Lift you on the kitchen counter. Flavors one. Chocolate chip and sugar Never tasted better By the better That's what you said Bombay ice and bitter Never took me quicker Are you ready? Cause I want it again I, I, I need you To feed me Relieve my hunger mm, Need you to need me And call me lover Craving the same
It's brand new. I literally just showed it to her today because I, I was in Miami like a few days ago for a week. And let's say I had a really good time. <laughs> I saw some of the pictures. Yeah. I understand. I met, a, I met a cute little mama and I got pretty inspired and transpired. And um, it's a song called Don't Stop. And it's the first time we ever play it here, so live. Oh, nice. So there you go. Women Who Write, thank you for having us. Again, this is Koyananta. <laughs> wrote down the intro on your bed upstairs because yeah. all right let's see yeah no slower than okay. uh -huh. oh okay. there one okay. <laughs> two three four
All right, if we do one more, is it okay if we do a cover? Yeah. You want to hear a cover? Sure. 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 The song everybody knows, maybe we can get people singing along. Yes, yes. Cool like we love that. that. We were hoping. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know this one, right? Maybe. <laughs> Since we're all about cookies and sugar and stuff like that, you know? <laughs> Honey's pretty nice, too. Like Jules Byrne, right? There you go. And Galley. Galley, G A L L I. Okay, and then, and the, the name. Uh, without Your Love, the, yeah, Without Your Love EP is the name of the EP. And so when is this stuff gonna get recorded? Um, Soon. You right? know, 
this yeah, I know. producer. I, I'm working on some demo. Like the demo's already done, so I feel pretty good with it. And uh, just talking to people, seeing what you know, how it can be so done. So if you guys buy without your love, then it'll help for sure. That's right. Then yeah. Jules and Koi can record this stuff, and yep. we want it recorded. Mm -hmm. And I can keep going to we Miami some, for more inspiration. Okay, there you go. Oh, we, need, we need some more of that. <laughs> Hands around. No, she's okay. She's okay. She's fine. Okay. She's fine. Okay. No, she's fine. Um, I love women. I respect them. Unless they ask me not to. Thank you so much. One more hand. Okay. All right. Now, I we never have one uh, musical performer do that much material. But do you understand why we did that? Yeah. Yes. Was that like unbelievable? Yes. Holy Moses. One more hand for Jules Galleon. <laughs> Ghost in Electric, which you really, I, I cannot, it, I cannot suggest it strongly enough for those of you out there who are in the LA metropolitan area, why weren't you here? Because it's different here. It's different when you're in the room. I don't care how good it is out there. But but anyway, when they're electric, um, Jules puts down like guitar and he dances as, as, as good as he sings and as good as he writes music, he dances just as well. Um, so yeah, it's it's absolutely crazy and exciting and thrilling to uh, to and all of them to perform. Um, they're they're fantastic. It's it's a great show. So um, I feel I feel very honored that we got to hear um, that song for the first time performed yeah. here. That's pretty exciting. Um, everything about today is kind of a little exciting. Um, our next guest is my co-star mm -hmm. <laughs> from Henry Daglin's The M Word. Yes, I had 30 seconds alone with Michael Imperioli, and they were some of the best 30 seconds of my life. Um, it, it's certainly, he's, he's shaking his head. He can't, he hates when I do this stuff. But seriously though, I got to do, I got to do about two minutes, well we actually probably shot more like five minutes of improvised, because with Henry Jaglin, everything is improvised. And we got to, we, we, I got to shoot a scene with Michael, um, and, to go mano a mano with Michael Imperioli is a pretty thrilling thing. Um, and to be able to, to be present in that moment and, and keep up with him was uh, great fun and something I cherish. And actually about 30 seconds of it ended up in the film, which is even uh, more shocking. But Michael also shares a birthday with my father. And um, what's so interesting about that, even if you don't believe in astrology, there are certain things, certain characteristics, certain traits and I don't know what a measure of a man would be more than both of those men. Um, gentlemen, ethics, morals, kindness, warmth, love, talent, charm. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm a little verklempt. I'm, I'm, I'm a little crazy about him, if you can't tell. Um, and oh, would I break my exception rule for him. But he's a happily married man for many, many years. And um, he respects that and so do I. Um, but the measure of a man right over there. Um, Michael's been here before. He came and, 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 and were you here, Lynn? No, I didn't Oh, make God, who, was anybody here? Was so, okay, so Ellen and Linda were here. And that was quite the day. Um, but it was before Michael wrote this. The perfume burnt his eyes. And I just want to say that, um, for those of you that are out there watching at home, I'm totally serious. What I ask for you to do, please, is to please support our artists. If you're not going to show up, if you're not going to make the drive, if you're going to sit at home in your pajamas, get on Amazon and buy The Perfume Burned His Eyes by Michael Imperioli and get on Spotify and Apple Music and buy Without Your Love by Jules Galley because that's the way we support. We, we can't do this if we don't support the artists. I mean, we are artists. We know what that's like, so do it. And this book, so I got the, I, I just, this is my copy that I'm going to have today, but... I listen to the audiobook. And if you're going to listen to any audiobook in the entire universe, one read by Michael Imperioli would be the place to start. Wow. So for about three days, Michael was talking in my ear, and, 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 and it takes place in an in a, in a environment that I'm very familiar with. Um, and there's sort of Lou Reed in there, but it's New York, and it's it's uh, it's rock and roll and it's drugs and it's um, it's fantastic and Michael embodies all the characters and uh, and the protagonist especially and um, uh, it's pretty fantastic 
and he's pretty fantastic doing it, so I recommend it highly. But um, but there's nothing sort of like holding holding a book in my hands. I kind of really like that experience, so I look forward to reading it as well because the nuance is different. You know, like I heard Michael's version of it, but when I read it myself, I'll have my own mental pictures, which I love to do. Um, okay, best known for Christopher as Christopher in The Sopranos, who doesn't know Michael as Christopher in The Sopranos, and we have a surprise guest with us today. Jason, would you please introduce us to our surprise guest? And Emmy, could you show our surprise guest? And, and maybe, um, I don't mean to embarrass you, but this is pretty thrilling that this is happening. So Jason, tell us, who did you bring with you today? Come on. She's, she's got a golden laugh. This is Leslie Vega. And why is Leslie Vega particularly <laughs> significant today? Leslie Vega is particularly <laughs> significant today because she played Tony Soprano's mistress. Yeah. <laughs> thank you for being here. Yeah, thank you for and, she, and she's gorgeous, and thank you for bringing her, Jason. Um, the least I can do. It, well, it's, off, it's awfully sporting of you. Um, the Sopranos, I don't even know what to say about it because nothing's ever come close and I don't know that anything ever will. The magic of that and Michael is an Emmy winner for that and was also nominated at least five times I believe is the the number. He was also nominated for numerous Golden Globes, SAG nominations. In addition to his role as a cast member he wrote five episodes of the show. Did you know that? Yeah. So we'll get to talk with Michael and he'll tell us what some of those were. Um, he also took a star turn on Law and Order. He was the voice of Frankie in Dream DreamWorks Academy Award nominated Shark Tale. Um, he starred in Mad Dogs on Amazon. As of, as late, currently, there's Blue Bloods, Lucifer, well, in recent past, the remake of Hawaii Five-0, Alec, Alec Unk, uh, Cabaret Maxime, Escape at Danamora, and Upcoming. The Last Full Measure, Primal, and Project Blue Book. The man works a lot. He's a screenwriter. He also penned The Summer of Sam. We're going to talk about that. He also wrote and directed his first feature, The Hungry Ghosts. And I believe there's another feature that he's going to talk to us about that was just shot recently, which is after The Hungry Ghosts, correct? Mm. The Hungry Ghosts is the one that you just shot in... in no? That's one, the one I read from when I came last time. That's the one you read from, but weren't you just in like Romania or some weird place shooting another film? I that... was in, just recently, I was in, I have a movie that I produced. Okay. And starred in, that premiered in Portugal. That's what I'm thinking. We shot about. it two years ago, but it pre premiered, and now it's hopefully gonna come. Gonna come around, okay, so well, you'll tell us mm -hmm. about that. Um, I, I, I don't want to do this anymore. I want to bring him up here. So, so what we're going to do with Michael is um, we're going to kind of do like a road taken. Uh, I'm going to, we're going to do a little Q&A first, and then Michael's going to read from his book um, at his request. So I am going to now bring up Michael Imperioli. <laughs> I mean every one of them, and it's it's not lip service. I absolutely adore you. I, I adored your oh, work. I adore you too. And that's why I'm here. No. Oh, 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 careful. Oh, oh. Um, um, you know, Michael does not live here. He lives far away, and he drove a great distance to come and be with us today. So I'm really grateful. I think for he's that a friend. Well. So. And um, and we share a great friend. Uh, Drew Neeporent, who owns Tribeca Grill with Nobu. Mr. De Niro, Nobu, and uh, yeah. yeah, and oh my God, and and. and my daughter, is she still down here? Sure. Did Samantha leave? Um, so my daughter, Samantha, who is like running up and down, um, works at Tribeca Grill. Drew gave her a job. And so one day, Michael came in with his whole family to celebrate his birthday on her grandpa, on her pop-up's birthday. Mm. And Samantha followed the rules and did not say she anything. Should, she should have she, broken they're, them. They're, not, they're not allowed to like talk to celebrities and like oh. do it, right, Samantha? There's my daughter, there's my gorgeous daughter. You Samantha. were there la last year. That was not my last yeah. year. Yeah, Samantha. and so Samantha didn't say anything to Michael because you're not supposed to talk to celebrities. But it's different, he's a family friend. Yes. You're allowed? To no, not allowed to, so she didn't. So she met him today anyway. But, um, Lynn, there's Samantha. I know, I'm trying to get her on. Oh, yeah. So, um, <laughs> 
and Michael, it, if I didn't say it, I think I said that he's a happily married man, but he's also a devoted father and has two two sons in that age. I have two sons and a daughter. Who's, I have a son who's 16, almost 17 now, 21, and uh, a daughter who's 28. Wow. 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 Okay. Yeah. So, so that's a, and so one is still in high school. One is in high school, one's in college, and one is an adult, functioning adult. Functioning, functioning is the operative word there. Yeah. yeah. Indep independent and functioning. Yeah. Independent and functional. Okay. That's uh, I, I keep mine dependent. I, I, I'm working to keep them dependent. No, that's terrible. Okay. So, Michael, for those people out here who don't know where you come from and how you started, how how did how did you did you always did you what did you want to be when your youngest memory of what you wanted to be when you grew up? What, what was it? Um. Probably. Uh, when I was a kid, I don't even yeah. remember. Well, uh, when did it strike I you? I wanted to be a doctor. Coy. Coy. I, I, I wasn't smart enough. <laughs> uh, but I started reading a lot of plays when I was in high school. And, Were you in them as well? No, no. Mm. Reading a lot of them. And uh, I had a good English teacher who took me on to a lot of stuff. And, uh, and then after high school, um, I was going to go to college, and then I decided not to go to college and, and to go to acting school in, in at least Strasbourg Institute in New York City. Um, Samantha's dad went there. What, what, what spark, what spark, something has sparked that? You know, it, it, it kind of snowballed, you know, like just getting into reading plays and You movies. hadn't performed them at no. all? No. Not at all? You went, you walked into Lee Strasberg having never been on stage? Well, like, when I was a little kid, I think we did something at school, but not really, no. And, no, and you got in? Yeah, well, they interviewed me. <laughs> I, we didn't audition. You, at really? the time, they just interviewed you, and if you, uh, you know, which was kind of a good thing because they, they got to know. So, like, what kind of stuff? Do you remember what kind of stuff they had? Like, how did you get into Lee Strasberg? That was 35 years ago. All right. <laughs> well, I don't know. I can, I can quote you every review I got from the time I was 17. But that's I don't remember. But, um,. But it was cool because uh, all of a sudden I was in class with adults. So I went from high school with teenagers. Right. And now, I mean, there were people in my class ranging from my age to 50, maybe more. I don't even know. Anybody who know it when you were there? Um, you know who Sean Young is? Yeah, I yeah. do. Sure. Um, Alec was in that class. Okay, so then you were in the class with Samantha's father because he What's was in the thing? same, Gabe Abelson, he was in the same class with Alec. I was in a class with Alec. Okay. I don't know if it was oh. the, but he was okay. there in, with, with the teacher that I was with. Um, there was a, a famous ballet dancer who became an actor who died pretty young named Alexander Gudinov. Oh, of course. Wow. Uh, Andrew McCarthy was there for a while. Oh. So how so how did you transition from going from interviewing to getting your ass up on the stage and actually <laughs> performing? How, I mean, because you came from just you know being in class and, and, and being inspired and uh, did it so obviously it came naturally to you. Naturally, yeah, maybe but it took a lot of work. Uh, so so did they do hardcore training there? Yeah, they did. Oh, yeah. And so at what point did you start to venture out of? school? Class and, and work. Yeah. It took a long time. It took a lot of auditions. You know, through backstage, the news, the trade news, we used to have the newspaper backstage and right. go on auditions for like plays that didn't pay any money and 400 people would be at the audition. And, and would you get some of those? No, I didn't. It took me four years before I got a play that didn't pay. <laughs> and then I got fired uh, three days after. Wait. Oh, I was the lead and I got fired three days after we opened. Wow. Well, it was devastating. Did, do you know why? Because I didn't know how to take direction. <laughs> I didn't know how to work with director. So the director would tell you something and you would just do it. I didn't like. respect him. Okay. So, got five, so Samantha, four years till he got um, his first pay. The writer went on to win the Academy Award, Whoa. which is interesting. But um, he, he was good. I liked him and I liked his writing, but I didn't like the director. Bobby Moresco, you know Bobby. He wrote um, Crash. Oh, wow. 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 Yeah. And I think he wrote Million Dollar Baby. I think he 
he was oh, wow. a co-writer. He would work with Paul Haggis a lot. He was a very good writer. It was a play about his brother. It was a very good play. And I got a lot of attention, a lot of press in the New York Times. Wrote a feature before it opened. My picture was in the New York Times. It was a big deal. And then... So you're... Wait. You're I didn't first know how play, I was, First he gets into Strasbourg, you know, having this, never been on a stage. I, then his first play, his <coughs> picture was in the New York Times. I, I didn't know how to be... I didn't know how to be theatrical. So when you're in acting class, it's just about... It's not about projecting in a theater. It's not right, about right. like state. It's not about stagecraft. It's about acting. Right. So I didn't know stage. I didn't know how to be loud. I didn't know how to be loud and truthful. Everything was very intimate. The director was asking things of me that later on I would know how to give him what he wanted and satisfy myself. But I didn't at the time, so I just I, resisted him. I see. So I kind of deserved to be fine. <laughs> so you were doing a very personal performance. Small and not not. It wasn't. You, you weren't know. filling up the theater. No, I didn't know how. I didn't take. I hadn't taken voice lessons or things like so that. So at Strasbourg, they don't prepare you. They you can you? if you go full time. Then they have voice and movement and all this mm. stuff. And I went part time, and I just took two acting classes. I movies. see. And that's all I did. So it took me a while to catch up. <laughs> and boy, did you struggle yeah. to catch! I mean, oh boy. But it was it was. Bad, okay, so man. so okay, so you get so you get fired. That has to suck so big. You're in the New York Times. That just has to be horrific. It was really bad. Yeah. So how do you rebound from that? What was next? Keep going. So what what, what was the next thing you got? I don't I don't really remember. But well, then I started was... doing. Uh, a friend of mine, a girl from my class, uh, had an audition for an agent, and we did a scene that we were working on, and mm -hmm. he signed both of us. So I started getting. Uh, Audition, real auditions, you know, not from the trade papers, you know, like with getting sent out. So I got a line in a movie. I got oh. a movie. It was my oh. first movie. What was it? Uh, it was a Morgan Freeman movie called Lean on Me. Oh, uh, hell where yeah. He played a principal, directed by John Albertson, who did Rocky. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I had one line. What was it? Which it got cut, but it was oh. <laughs> it's very ironic. The line, the line was, "Hey, I'm gonna be a star." That was. Like, <laughs> it got cut because I was so. Because now I now I get a movie. I've never been in front of a camera. Oh Because I've no. only been in acting class, working with other actors. Right. So I memorized the line, which wasn't hard. But now there's this huge Panavision, not a digital camera, a film camera. Right. You know, and it, I just froze. I just couldn't handle it. So I kind of mumbled the line to think maybe he wouldn't. There's a bunch of, there were a lot of teenagers in the scene. I was playing a high school kid. And everybody had lines and I did my line. And I mumbled it and then they cut and then he came over and he gave direction to everyone. He went to you and you with that line, give me something or you're out. Uh -huh. <laughs> And I'm in the movie, actually. You could see me. They cut the line, but you see me in the film. And that was another... He wasn't very kind, you know. He could have been. He wasn't very... Yeah, he was not very patient with, you know, all that was going on. But it was not a good experience at all. And that made you want to do it more? Of course. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so... No, you know, uh, to be an actor, really, I think you have to have a very delusional um, view of yourself. You have to be so deluded to think that your talent is so unique that somehow it's going to propel you to some level of being able to work consistently. Uh, Did you know you? Okay, so you you're coming you know out of I mean. that. You're coming out. Because it's of, so competitive, with so many people, and, and there's a lot of good people. Yes, there are. So you have to be kind of deluded to think that you know because the reality is very. If you if you really steep yourself in the reality of it, I, I think it's too overwhelming to, to try. But you must have had some basis of delusion in acting class to get the sense that what you were doing was working. I, I, I was, um, I had a good reputation among my peers in class and with my teacher. My teacher was very good. And, and, and why she was good is because she made us look at what we did as an art. And she said, I mean, she knew I wasn't going to college and she said, you don't have to go to college, but you have to educate yourself mm -hmm. about the world and especially about art, about literature and about painting and about music and understand what it means to be an artist because that's what this is or can be. So that and was- you, And you the, did that, you took that very seriously, didn't you? Yeah, we did. I mean, I think a, that was what made her a good teacher. She was a very good influence on me and without her, I don't think it would have you know, worked. So I had a good 
you know, I, I had a good reputation in that class. It was very, very competitive. And, you know, we lived or died on what she was saying mm -hmm. to us. And, and she loved me, and she, she, she was like a mother. You know, she died... Um, What's her not, name? Her name was Elaine Aiken. She died a oh, few yeah. years after I left her, but mm -hmm. she, was, she was quite exceptional, you know. So, so you've got... And, and I think a teacher can make all the difference. Um, oh, God, yeah. My high school drama teacher, my sixth grade teacher, was the reason that I got any confidence at all mm. and, and belief in myself as an artist, as a person. Um, so teachers, thank you. No, no. I mean, I just mentioned my English teacher, who's Mrs. German. She's still alive, actually, and, and Elaine, who very, very, you know, pivotal moments, you know, uh, influences. So, so you keep going. Do you have to take a day job during this? Of course. So what kind of... I work mostly in the restaurant business. Okay, so... Every other actor. So where did where, you work? Uh, so many places. Because uh, Drew and I met the at the Zinc. Club. You remember oh, the Zinc. Of course. I worked there for many years. I worked at Film Center Cafe, I worked mm -hmm. at Chez Josephine, I worked at uh, Un de Trois. Oh God, you at, probably uh, waited on me while, <laughs> while Drew and I, yeah. while we Barocco, were Barocco, I worked at, yeah, a lot of places. So, what? Oh, I mean, just my memories. Oh yeah. <laughs> Un de Trois. Un de Trois, yeah. yeah. Um, that's cool, yeah. The theater district, that's a, uh, yeah, mm. it's, a, it's a good place for pre prefix. Mm -hmm. So, so, mm -hmm. what's the first thing that sort of, Changes that energy and kind of propels you into. Oh, Goodfellas. I had that was the fourth movie. How did that happen? I had an agent at the time, so I got an audition. And, you know, That's a pretty good place out. to break. Yeah, no, that was at least something that everybody in the industry saw that you can point to and say, "Well, I'm in this." And, oh yes, because everybody saw it, so that helped get work. You know. So from Goodfellas, you didn't go right into The Sopranos. What? 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 No, what, that what? was about. Eight years. So, what was happening in that eight-year period? I mostly between? did independent film and theater. I, I through a lot of the people in my class, we started working together in theater. I started producing theater in my early twenties, and then directing theater and some of the. Didn't you have your own theater at some point? Later, after okay. I was married, after mm -hmm. Sopranos, and we built a theater, my wife and I. But this was early. This is in around 1988. We started producing theaters in New York. And and. Uh, do you have at that time? Because I know you do now. Did you have a spiritual practice back then? No. What? 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 Um, I'm just curious. This is a sidebar. What, what? Did you have a spiritual awakening? No, I just had. I just was miserable. <laughs> Misery helps. Which is that usually got, what that got me there. Brings people to spiritual. Uh huh. Yeah. And and having had a spiritual awakening, and I. I, I don't know if it's an awakening. It's kind of a gradual. It's not like a. It's not like an aha moment, yeah, people, like a gradual kind of need for some, some other way of looking at the world, some other view. And what you found? What have I found? What you found? Um, I got into Tibetan Buddhism about 10 years ago. 10 years ago? 11 years ago. Mm -hmm. yeah. And has it been transformative? Yeah. Are you less miserable? Um, yeah, I mean... It, Listen, life is a, you, you, you realize that the most important thing I learned is that everything changes all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, that things that, I was going through a really hard time, something really, when we had the, the when my, friend, my wife and I built the theater in New York around 2003, and then 2007, somebody uh, put a bomb in front of it, <gasps> a pipe bomb. And exploded it and damaged the building. And uh, were they doing? Were they targeting it, or was it just no one random? Ever, no, no one ever found out why. It could have been just random. random. It could have been some, you know, anything. Disgruntled soprano. It was fans. very disturbing, and it was very. Uh, the police were kind of convinced that it was somehow connected to me because the show was on, and you know, it was it was kind of a, the Sopranos was a hit, and everyone knew me in the city, and they were asking if. You know, I had any enemies, or was I involved in this or that, or did I have a girlfriend or mistress? You know, they say bombs are uh, kids, kooks, and spurned lovers. Really, yeah. spurned pipe, lovers? Do pipe bombs? bombs? Not okay. I mean, oh, like okay. big, you know, like not terrorist bombs. No. Okay. Yes. What? So I went through a lot of. Uh, I had to deal with the police, and then they were outside my house for a while, and wow. it was right before. It was right after Labor Day, so my kids were going back to school, and I was very 
paranoid that mm. someone, what if someone really was trying to? Because now it's only a few years after 9-11. It was still a lot of that very difficult tension in the city. Yes. We lived down there. We had to evacuate and all that shit. So, um, and I was really, di I was going through a very hard time and I called this Tibetan um, Lama. And um, it was before I became a Buddhist, and I told him I was feeling, and he said, you know, I, he, was, he wasn't in New York, and he said to me, uh, you know, the only thing I can tell you is, he said, you know, everything changes. And he says, you feel this now, and you're going through it, but it's going to change. Mm -hmm. And it really stuck with me, um, because now, uh, you know, like two years ago, whatever you were going through that seemed so monumental and occupied all your time, you look back and you're like, oh, really? <laughs> I mean, now there, there are, you know, there's loss and there's things that happen and tragedies. Mm -hmm. But I'm talking about on more of a day to day thing, mm -hmm. you know. So, yes, it is transformative. And are you able to call it up when you need it? Yes and no. Yeah, yes. Right? Because there's no. also a no. Because sometimes I know from my, yeah, for yeah, myself, yeah. sometimes I can't. We're find human it. beings. Mm -hmm. right? You know, you get, you, you, you know, you get emotions and calm and you get trapped by things. But um, definitely there's, in the teachings, tools to handle it better, you know. Do you, yeah, has definitely. it impacted your art? Um, that's a difficult question. I don't mm -hmm. know. I mean, do you, I do, really you know. do you feel, because I know through my spiritual practice, I, I mean, part of mine is that we share all the time out loud our feelings. So I found that through that, I'm much more expressive in my art about the truth, because mm. I get to the truth, which I never used to get to prior. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Yeah. So okay. So how did you? How did the Sopranos happen for you? Because that had to be a life. I changer. just you know the casting people were uh, people who I'd gotten to know, and they cast mm -hmm. me in some indie movies, and they always had me up for anything that was remotely right for, and auditioned for David in New York, David Chase, who created the show, and then um, they flew did you me do to a, LA. Did you do a reading with with um, James Gandolfini? No, I did. I read for David, and then they flew me to L.A. to test for. HBO. So mm -hmm. I remember in the waiting room for the tests was it was me. I was the only one reading testing for my part. Lorraine Bracco was the only one testing for her part the, as the psychiatrist. Edie Falco, who I knew really well, she was testing the only one testing for her part. But testing for Tony Soprano were three people. Oh wow! It was Michael mm -hmm. Rispoli, who's on the Deuce now, who was in the Sopranos, had a, a small part, was a dear friend of mine. So I was just mm -hmm. happy to see him. Yeah. James Gandolfini, who I didn't know, but I had heard about. I didn't know his work either. And some other guy who I, I didn't, you know, I knew I knew his face, but he looked, but I couldn't place it. And it was little Steven Van Zandt. Uh -huh. and Silvio Dante. Wait, he was, he was auditioning for, for Tony Soprano. In, this, oh. in Silvio Dante wig and everything. And, and <laughs> Sheila Jaffe, who you probably know, band. casting person came up to me and said, because like, oh, I knew the face, but right with hair, together, and without, the, actor, without the thing, without without his you know his bandana, and um, that was wow. the final auditions for the uh, for the leads. And, and so, he, did they group you to get? Did they? No, you no, just, you just all went did alone. Separate. And then I think he wrote Silvio Dante. I think he might have wrote that for Little Stephen or something. That's that's. He, David saw Little Stephen give. It, an induction speech for the Rascals at the uh, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Mm -hmm. And he watched the speech and he thought there was something in his charisma and in his being, and he's from New Jersey and he's Italian. His name's not what he is. <laughs> and he, he thought there was something there. So he had You know, I have to say, I, I listen to Underground Garage. I have Sirius. Mm -hmm. And every day that little St that Stephen's show is on, he does, like, he, he'll tie together music. If any of you listen... He'll tie together music and film, and yeah. he'll do these like retrospect. He's so knowledgeable, oh, yeah. so fascinating, yeah, yes. and a great storyteller. Yes. Um, if you have Sirius, I recommend it. His show is yes. amazing. Yes, yeah. um, okay, so do you find out right away? Do you how, do you have to suffer? What was no, what's, no? I think they, you know. I mean, it, uh, it was mine to lose, basically. But you were the only one auditioning yeah, at that point. So either I delivered or I didn't get it. So now, do you guys know what you're sitting on when you start? No, 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 no. Because mm -hmm. there weren't really series on cable. So the it's idea true. of a series on cable was, was a lark. You know, mm -hmm. It wasn't something you're thinking it could be a hit at all. And the script, 
you know, the pilot script was good, but it, it really didn't indicate the scope of where it could go, and you don't know where it could go. Right. You know, it's like, I don't know. I, it seemed, there was a lot of humor in it, so I was like, is this like a spoof of the mob? Is it a comedy? But then there was some darkness to it. A lot of darkness. <laughs> so we didn't, I really know. What I did know was they were getting really good people. Right. So when they picked it up, we did the pilot, they picked right. it up, so we shot the first season a, a year later. Then when all oh, the Oh, really? Others, a year later? Yeah. Wow. We, we did it in the summer. We didn't go back, maybe the spring, mm -hmm. nine months or something. But when the, all the other scripts started coming in and we were reading them, then I, I was, and they got deeper and more intricate and more complex and interesting. And I was like, okay. Then I felt we were onto something. And well, did you and James Gandolfini have an instant, like, was that something that took building or did you have an instant report? Oh, pretty instant, yeah. I, I didn't know how to drive and I had to drive in the pilot. <laughs> and I drove, as, I had to drive and it was a scene and me, he's in the passenger seat and I'm backing up oh. on the sidewalk with trees on the side and extras getting out of the way, <laughs> looking behind me and delivering dialogue. And I had to do it about 10 times on the 10th time I smashed into a tree. Oh, <laughs> my first film, my first, I had to drive, I didn't drive either, and I had to drive a little sports car with a stick, and so I, I so relate so, to what you're saying. But I didn't have James Gandolfini. I didn't have James Gandolfini. Because he thought it was hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> I thought they were going to fire me, but they just brought another car on. <laughs> we did it again after that. Wow. And have you learned to drive since then? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you got here today. Mm -hmm. So, so at what point do you guys know? Well, okay. So you know that the that the quality of the work is mm. there and it's worthy. At what point? How long did it take till it hit? Was it right away? Well, it went on the air in January '99, mm. and it was really the reviews that made us mm. realize that something. The reviews were like so crazy, deservedly uh, hyperbolic. So. They were so good that Saturday Night Live did a spoof <laughs> on the reviews, not on the. <laughs> Not on the show, like literally on That's if I had the chance to, you know, cure cancer and see the secrets of the universe or watch The Sopranos, <laughs> I would watch The Sopranos, like shit like that. So the reviews were so good that we were wow. like, that kind of, it, the critics really kind of forced the public to watch the show, basically, basically because of those reviews. Well, I was there before I read a review, but, um, and I think a lot of us were who kind of saw it was coming. Um, and you got to do a lot of, you got to go through a lot of changes on that show. Mm, I mean, your drug addiction the thing, mm. and your, the sex stuff, and yeah. your anger, and mm. the movies, and being a writer, and all that stuff that you went through. Um, you really got to shit layers yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and do that a was lot the of, of it. incredible And there was work. an evolution to it, which often in television, you know, well, now you do, but back then it wasn't really the case, you know, in television. So, so... So you evolved from so was that so how was it for you guys when it was ending? Were you, were you guys ready for it to be over or did you want more? I trusted that it was you know that David would end it properly you know without just extending it because there was a demand for it you know which sometimes can stretch it out and dilute it or whatever and he just felt this is you know but it was. How did you feel about the yeah. ending? Huh? Oh, I, I really liked the last episode a lot. I mean, I thought uh, David was never somebody who ties things up in little bows, you know, he's, you know, because he feels that doesn't really happen in life. Do you, do you have a projection of what you think it meant? I always meant, thought it meant that Tony Soprano was shot and killed there, but that, I don't think that's necessarily correct. Mm -hmm. I mean, after David, I think David's, I'm not sure what he said about it, Interesting. Um, and then, so how did Summer of Sam happen for you? How did you, how did, well, you wrote some episodes, what, what, what episodes of The Sopranos did you write? Anything that you can? Um, well, the first, I wrote a spec script after the first season because I really liked the show a lot. Had you been writing that. before that? I had written a long time before that, but I never finished anything until Summer of Sam, which came out. Uh, after the first season of Sopranos. So okay, so how did that I happen? I wrote a script <clears throat> with Summer Sam. Yeah. Well, I had done a few movies with Spike Lee, so I brought it to him, and he really liked it. And so what, how, what prepared you to write a screenplay? I'm writing one now, so I want to just, know. Just uh, trial and error. You just did it? Just trial and error. And it just no, happened just writing me. a lot of shitty ones. Okay, oh, okay. Reading a lot of screenplays, mm -hmm. and writing a lot of 
the shitty screen. And did you go? Did you write it on spec, or did you go to Spike and say? No, I wrote it on spec. I wrote it with some, uh, another writer, and then we brought it to him. So the Summer of Sam. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, where have you been? <laughs> but um, but David Berkowitz and I, I've told this to you, Michael. My brother went to school with David Berkowitz at Columbus, which is Columbus High School in the Bronx, which is crazy. Um, David Berkowitz was a little older than him, and he was just a freak. You know, nobody. I mean, well, not a freak like a freak that we know him to be now, but he, nobody really mm. wasn't. Jesus. Yeah, but uh, so what motivated you? What, what, what about that story made that the story you wanted to tell? Um, because there was someone in my family who, because what happened is, in the, I grew up in Mount Vernon, New York, which is next to the Bronx, but mm -hmm. there were killings in, very close to us. Right. So people started, because the cops were saying on TV, you go, you know, he probably lives among you. He's probably the guy that's a loner on the block who lives in an attic or a basement. So people started looking at their neighbors, at each other. Jesus. Like, literally. Yeah. Like, putting, you know, and in certain neighborhoods where, you know, in the Bronx, there's these tough guys and they'd make lists of, you know, it became like Nazi Germany. Well, who's on the list? Well, he, he just got divorced. He's gay. He's dumb drug, you know, and it was like that. Like, who, anybody who was an outsider. I'm sure the FBI were crazy busy. But these were people in the neighborhood. <laughs> but, wow. These were like friends and family and a, and some, and a well, cousin you, of mine was... But you wrote was, that in there. I mean, that's... That's true. Uh, yeah, that's a cousin true. of mine was beaten almost to death by people he knew. Who Wait, who's was, the character that, that, are, that people think it is? Uh, it's Adrian Brody's character. Right, Adrian Brody. But that's Brody. not based... That, that happened in several neighborhoods in New York mm -hmm. where there were attacks of people. People who knew these people. Neighbors Jesus. turning on them for whatever reason because there was, you know, that's what inspired the writing of that story. Wow. So it really was not a story about the killer. It was more about the hysteria and paranoia and, 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 and it's really about, you know, ju judging the outsider, judging someone for being different and then taking that to this very extreme limit. Adrian Brody was brilliant in that film, as John yeah. Leguizamo, wow. I mean, that it's yeah. an incredible film if you haven't seen mm. it. I hope it's on Netflix or something and you can get it. It's oh, an yeah, amazing it film, very disturbing. Mm -hmm. um, so darkness seems to follow you, Michael. Mm -hmm. you, you are attracted to darkness, mm -hmm. um, and yet, you played a very funny character on Californication. Um, mm. uh, you were fantastic yeah, on that show. Um, and That's in fact, Evan show. has a book called It's Only Temporary, which is very in keeping it's with exactly your philosophy. Said, yeah. Yes. Um, but yeah, very funny, on, which I didn't expect and was surprised when you were so funny mm -hmm. on that show. Um, and so I saw there are five projects that are in post-production right now. So of, of all of those things, are any of them light? Are they all heavy? What, what's going on? What's been your latest work? Mm -hmm. Uh, some of them are heavy. I did a movie called Primal with Nicolas Cage just a few months ago. That's a that's kind of an action, kind of a thriller. Mm. That's a pretty cool. Uh, Cabaret Maxine is an indie movie that I shot with a lot of people that I've worked with over the years. We shot it uh, when the director is a Portuguese director. We shot. That's it the Lisbon. one I was thinking of. And uh, that I really love that movie. It's really personal, and I think it's we are uh, it premiered it, in. It, it, in the theaters in Portugal, but now well, we, we've you know submitted it to other festivals in Europe and hopefully get a distributor here in America. Well, I hope so too. And 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 so, Michael, what 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 uh, the perfume burned his eyes? What 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 sparked this? Um, I spend a lot of my time reading books, reading fic novels, mm -hmm. you know, fiction, literature. I, 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 it's a big love of mine, mm -hmm. maybe more than anything else. Um, really? Yeah. A fa do you have a couple favorites? Anything jump to mind? Like books that you've read that have been... That's a hard question to ask off yeah. of that. Um, well, there's books that influence this. Like what? Like uh, Candide mm -hmm. and uh, Catcher in the Rye, who mm -hmm. very obviously influenced mm -hmm. this. And, um, Is so, he you? No, mm -hmm. none of the book is true. It's all fiction. Um, but uh, I, I got frustrated with the development process of some writing projects I had for television, and um, and all the people that you have to deal with and get approval from, and all this stuff. So I, uh, the idea of writing a book was to create something that was an end to itself, because a screenplay is a, a blueprint, really. 
And everybody else has their fingers in it. Well, yeah, but a screenplay is not a work of art, really. It's a blueprint to make a work of art. It doesn't, it th really has no function outside of that. You know right. what I mean? Once the movie is done, the screenplay is nothing. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to just do something where I could have that control and take it from beginning to end without, you know, and, and it be an end unto itself. So uh, in 2013, my middle child was 16 and I wanted to relate to that mind, you know, because mm -hmm. he was going through some 16 year old things um, so I started writing this character and I set it in New York uh, in 76 which did is, you know Lou, Lou Reed had you met him yeah well I did I in 1976 I was 10 so I wasn't in Manhattan at right. the time, but I liked that time period uh -huh. uh, so three months into the writing of it Lou died and I, I got to know Lou around 2000 Lou was always a big hero of mine artistically, mm -hmm. and, um, so, and so when he died, it hit me on a no number of levels, personally and artistically, and I had the idea of putting these two characters together, and that's the story. Really. It's mo more about the boy, but right. Lou is a major character in the book. A very right? interesting Kind of character. a father figure. The boy loses his two major male role models in a short, in like six months, his father and his grandfather, right. and he moves from a blue collar neighborhood in Queens. Uh, Which, by like the, the way, place. I think he went to the same school that I actually Jackson went to, Heights. Newtown High School. School. Oh, yeah, really? that's where I went to. He went to Newtown. School. Yeah, it freaked me out when I'm reading uh, your no, book. That's pretty. I didn't go to. I didn't even <laughs> but know I that. Did. I had to research all that yeah, stuff because I, I didn't Newtown. live there. So his mother inherits some money from the grandfather, and they move to kind of a posh apartment Don't tell on too the much. east side of New York. And living above him is. Lou Reed, who's in a particularly crazy drug addled period of his life. And now you're going to read to us. Because yeah. we want to hear Michael yeah. Imperioli. Okay. Right? Yeah. yeah. So, so move, come wait. Oh, you're on camera. Come, yeah, you're on camera. So, so move your stool so, so you're. So, yeah. And I gotta, I'll read some. It's rinky ding. But, uh, I heard the music before I got to his door. It was open just a sliver, so I pushed it a little wider. He was on the rug playing an acoustic guitar. I had never seen him with anything but an electric. He played a very simple riff over and over again, two chords. It was hypnotic, concentrated, and sad, and so was he. He didn't notice me for about 30 seconds because his head was bent and cocked at an odd angle down toward the gaping orifice of the instrument. There was a photograph and a red tank top at his feet. He may have been staring at either one of them or both. A bottle of Johnny Walker Black sat a little to his right. He looked up, saw me in the doorway. He didn't stop what he was doing but gave enough of a nod to say I was welcome to come in. I didn't want to interrupt him but I didn't want to leave. I wanted to stay inside of that moment with him, inside the quiet. It felt right. It almost felt good. I sat on the floor across from him. I didn't feel like a guest. I belong there. It was mine as much as his that day. I'm composing a symphony, Tim. It's something I think I will be very proud of. He kept on strumming the two chords of his song. It was sparse, stark, and bare. But I'm sure he was hearing much, much more than, was, than what was coming out of his guitar. It's a symphonic suite. It's very formal and structured with scrupulous discipline. I'm putting everything I have into this one, Tim. Everything I have, everything I can get. The New York Philharmonic strings, a Mormon tabernacle choir. No, fuck the Mormons. I'd rather have the Vienna boys. He glanced at me. And I want the middle part to sound like the last day of heaven. Celestial voices, violins, and cellos. I love cellos. The cello is the musical instrument that resembles the human voice more than any other. He stared at the photo. As my eyes got used to the room's dim light, I could see it was a picture of him and Rachel. He was sitting on her lap, and her arms were wrapped around him in a very protective way. She was wearing the same red tank top that was on the floor in front of him. Tim, me boy, this will be the first rock song to change water into wine, feed the multitudes, and raise the dead from their tombs. This last statement made him 
chuckle. And as the middle part hits its coda, God reaches down with his purple and his finger and grabs Adam right by the apple. And then the words start coming. And now I'm the coldest motherfucker ever walked the block in Harlem mid-December. Bobby Sledge, a.k.a. Bobby Rikers, carried a straight razor in his boot. Every time he went to the toilet, he dipped the blade into the bowl before he flushed whatever it was that came out of him. So the blade was constantly contaminated with all kinds of breeding bacteria, amoebas, parasites, and boogeymen. <laughs> Woe unto she who got a bit of Bobby's blade. Lou stopped playing the guitar. He took a big swig of scotch, then a cigarette. He coughed five or six times after the first long <coughs> drag and hacked up something nasty into a tissue. And then he stuck the smoking ciggy back in his mouth and resumed his rip. And Bobby is just going to tell the truth, man, right in the middle of the fucking church. He's going to lay out all the cold, heartless, pitiless reality of this gutter we call life on earth. Another pause in the music as he took a long pull on his cigarette. And then, just as sudden as it started, it changes. Bang, and now it's 1957, and we're on a street corner in the Bronx, and it's the middle of the night, and Dion and the Belmonts are serenading all our sisters and our mothers and our lovers. Shit, maybe I'll ask Dion to do it himself, sing a few bars or a chorus. That would be very cool. You like Dion, Tim? Um, I like The Wanderer. This made Lou laugh. You got good taste, kid. Maybe I'll get you instead of Dion. He stopped talking and, and, and kept playing for a long time. It seemed like it would go on this way forever. And then he started singing. Love has gone away And there's no one here now He repeated those lines over and over and over. I'd never heard his voice sound that way before. It was a delicate, fragile, wounded voice, and it echoed off the thick white of the walls. And then he added, took the rings off my fingers. That last phrase broke him. He kept strumming, but he stopped singing. He didn't cry or sob audibly, but the tears fell on his hands and strings. I reached for his cigarettes without asking. It was both deliberate and unconscious, and I had never done it before. He caught me out of the corner of his eye, but didn't question my being so bold. I think it pleased him, though his face was so full of misery, I can't say for sure. The fight and ferocity had left him, so had the cruelty and viciousness he could access in an instant. The child was in his arms. I felt like his older brother. Uh, the better part of two years, uh, but I only would write when um, I was home, like a few times during the, I was on location, but I couldn't, uh, I had to be not doing anything else when I was working on it. What, what, what was your, your writing, dis I mean, would you put in like long hours when you were writing? No, or? like four or five in the morning, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. four or five, and, but every day, and that's it. Did you have to do more than one draft? Yeah. Please say yes. <laughs> Absolutely, yes, oh, a couple of drafts. Yes. Um, and so, what uh, what haven't you done that you'd still love to do? Is there something? What haven't I done? Yeah, I mean, is there anything that like burns that like oh. you, like you did this? This is something new for you. Is there? Yeah, but it did, see, but it didn't burn until there was a need for it. You know okay. what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, um, I remember that. Uh, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, it didn't burn until there's a need for it. I, I do get that. Right. So, so right now, is life comfortable? Is, it, is there no burn because you're satisfied? No, I just want, I, I haven't worked in three months, and I really want to. I'm bored. You know? So, well, <laughs> okay, so, so are, you, are you reading for, are you going, are you? I get bored, man, when I'm not working. It's like I don't have any hobbies. So my work is my hobby. You have no hobbies. No, none. I really don't. <laughs> I thought about that the other day. I was talking to someone like, well, what are your hobbies? They said, and I was like, I don't, I don't have any hobbies. <laughs> like, work is my hobby. So well, yeah. I haven't been, so, um, I mean, I've been doing stuff for the, the book and traveling for it. And, 
and stuff. So that kind but of that, that, that but that takes time. I mean, you tra- yeah, you just came back from satisfying. Italy. So what was it like going? So Christopher goes to Italy. I can't imagine what the people in Italy are like when you come to town. No, they're very. Um, they get it. Hell you know, yeah. they, the book came out in Italian in June, so wow. they, they, and they were very. Um, they're a lot. The, they're a lot less cynical um, than here. Like, you know, people here is like, oh, he's an actor and he's writing a book and he's, you know, it's there's a whole baggage that often they put on you, but they didn't do that there. Really. Mm-hmm. They kind of accept it on its own terms. Not everybody does that here, but there, there is a vibe of that. Um, some there's, journals, I, I imagine some. there's cynicism, like how could you find, yeah, like this yeah, is yeah. like a vanity thing for you and of not course. really. Well, you know, but, in, you know, I mean, that's something. That, but I, I, it was just refreshing not to deal with that there. At least from the journalists, they would take things very, for what it is, you know, not, not I love what that. they think it is. You know. And how about theater? Have you done have you Not done in theater? a long time, and I miss it a lot. Is that I, something I you'd like to do again? I will do it again, yeah. I mean, How about I, Broadway? I, uh, Does that call I've never done Broadway. Yeah. I mean, it depends on the play. I mean, right. I, I would love to do something on Broadway, but it, but it's, it would have to be, it's about the play. Of I mean, course. is always about the play. Absolutely. So I don't know what that would be. Have you written a play? No. Is that something you might do? Mm-hmm. Maybe you write yourself that vehicle. Who's your favorite playwright? Tennessee Williams. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He's amazing. What's what's the what's your favorite role that you've ever done on stage? Do you have a favorite role that you've done on stage? On stage? Mm-hmm. Mm. I don't even know. I don't think I. I mean, I the last play I did was really fun. It was called Chicken. It was by a guy named Mike Batista, a really good playwright. That was fun. Was it? A comedy? I haven't done uh, classical things. Mm-hmm. And, you know, most of the plays I've done were original material, like mm-hmm. new stuff. The, the theater that my wife and I built was all only for new plays that had never been produced. That's pretty fantastic. So, no, there's no role that I want to do. I mean, I, I just will do something if it's, you know, interesting. I, I, I started notes on a new book, but I haven't sat formally to begin the process of writing it, but I, I pro- if I don't get a job, I probably will. What about turning this into? Yeah, I'm gonna. Uh, I, I just started. Uh, my agent just started getting it to some producers because I wasn't. You know, when I wrote it, I didn't think at all about anything but the words. Right. Because the book is only about words and sentences. You know, writing a good sentence. That's all I care about. But then, when people started reading it, they were like, "Oh, you're gonna make it a movie? It's very visual." It's. And then when I went to Portugal in May to see Cabaret Maxime. It was something about the visual language of it that made me think, and the way the cinematographer shot it. And I called her up and I said, I want to do my, I sent her the book and I said, you, would you shoot this? And so now I'm trying to find a producer. Nice. My agent sending it out to some producers. But I think I, I, I want to uh, uh, make it a movie, direct it as a movie, adapt it. Yeah. I love that, I hope you do. Me too. I have a I, question I, actually. It was really interesting because you know you're such a prolific writer and you're so gifted. Did you? Thank and, you. That's right. Well, yeah, and then you expressed your love for Tennessee Williams, who's one of my all-time favorites. Same um, birthday, March twenty-six. Get wait, no, really? Yeah. Oh wow. Yeah. My dad. Um, my question is, do you ever get caught up in judgment? I mean, the great playwrights are so brilliant because. Of, I mean, Ibsen and Chekhov and Eugene O'Neill and Strindberg and Shaw and whether well, it's Mamet or Shanley, I mean, Tennessee Williams, Pinter, you just think, how can I ever compare? Do you ever get caught up in that, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Compare and despair is what can, they call it. Compare and despair <laughs> and judgment. Well, that, you, can't, I write, you I can't ever, I don't think, I mean, I know for a fact I could never write as good as any of those guys, but I might be able to write something, uh, that's mine, that people might, my only thing is if I like it, right? If I write, if I write what I like, mm-hmm. maybe other people will like it. I mean, says that. Yeah. You can, I mean, those, those people are, you know, want you one in a million, you know, there's not that many, not that many, but I did, I, uh, I met um, Salman Rushdie recently, and we were talking, 
I gave him a copy of this, but I don't know if he's read it yet. But I asked him, I said, do you have bad days? Huh? You know, when you're working? And he goes, of course. I said, do you I mean days where you just feel like you're just doing shit? He goes, of course. You know, and that was like, it's not just like he's sitting there. So <laughs> and brilliant, 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 brilliant. But I love what you said, said about if you like it, then it's good. I know when I've written something that's going to impact somebody. I know. I know as soon as I write it, if it's good or if it's shit. I know. You do. Yes. I mean, I don't know if I have that sense, but I, what I do is I, re I write it and then I read it out loud. Yes, me too. And if there's kind of a flow to it, mm -hmm. then I feel like it's working. I think Albie said that as well. Uh, someone came up to Albie after he wrote The Goat, and, uh, and they said, you know, how do you feel you haven't had a hit? And he's like, well, you know, why have you stopped writing? And he said, just because I haven't had anything out doesn't mean I've stopped uh -huh. writing. I've always written and I'll always continue to write. And if, if you get it, then, then, you know, you get it. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting that you feel the same way. And Sting said that too. He was like, I just write and if other people get it and I love it and they get it too. Yeah, because yeah, you, you have no control over that. You have no control over the success or failure. So you just have, this, you have the control over making something you think yeah. is it, you know. My acting teacher always said, and, and I applied it to this a lot, right? Um, when you did a scene, so she would, the first thing she'd say, did you do what you set out to do? Mm, I like that. So when people ask, well, what do you, you know, how do you feel about this or this? I said, you know, why I feel it's a success to me mm -hmm. is that I felt I did what I set out to do with it. So if I, if you do that, whether it's a, a million people right. read it, ten people read it, it makes a million dollars or ten dollars, you know, you can't really, you don't have control over those things. So what you have control is if, if you did what you set out to do. You know, A.J. Benza was, uh, I interviewed him last week, and he was he held up his book and my book, and now I hold up your book, and he said, you know, all this other stuff that we do, it comes and it goes, films, all this stuff, but you know, like when the earth is like dust, these things will exist. These these books that people will hold can hold yeah. in their hands like exist. They they, they last forever. Yeah. Hopefully, oh. people still know how to read them. That's, <laughs> oh, that's all. <laughs> that's what I pray for. <laughs> and I think uh, that was a Twilight Zone episode. It, it, actually, it was. Yes, you're right. You're right. Um, okay, so now for those of you out there, um, please go to Amazon and buy the perfume. Design. Or better, go to your local independent oh, bookstore. And, and we have our local independent yeah, bookstore here best. selling them once upon a time in Montrose, California. And I want to give them a big shout out because uh, support your local bookstore. Otherwise, they're one of the last left. And it's really horrible what's going yeah. on. So yes, I agree with and you. there's cool people there who will turn you on to that, stuff you would never probably hear about. So, so true. Yeah. And, and they and, love books there. That's a good thing. They do, mm -hmm. and they support art. They support mm -hmm. writers, which is uh, authors, and also Spotify, Apple, Apple Music. Where else, Jules? Where's your music? Uh, there's Title, Title, Apple Music, Tidal. Spotify. I don't even know what Title is. That's how old it's, I am. It's a new one. It's, okay. It's, it's fairly new. And so, then, um, um, and you can also buy it on iTunes. You can, you Amazon. Know, you, you can buy it on Am Amazon. Oh, Amazon. Okay, so you it's can without also your buy love. TV through my website, jewelsgalley.com, if you want it. I'm Jules Galley. So I will have all the links to Michael's book, to Jules's music. Um, thank you so much, both of you, for doing, oh, three of you. Koi Anunta is amazing. Ridiculous. So if you, you have to see her in person to really appreciate what that was because she's mine. If, to have somebody stopping a doctor to do this, you gotta be really good at this. She's really good at this. Um, and, and for her parents, she made the right choice, it says this Jewish mother. Uh, anyway, thank you all so much. Right now we're gonna go and we're gonna buy some books. We'll yeah. see you next time.